Retirement is often seen as a destination, but we believe it's an opportunity to pursue your passions, realize your dreams, and live a purposeful life. Great decisions, incredible lives. Retire with Intention podcast is about more than just money. It's about embracing the things that truly matter, the experiences, the relationships, and the impact you leave behind. Here is your host, John Creekmer. Well, everybody, welcome back to Great Decisions, Incredible Lives, and thank you so much for spending time with us again uh, another week. And as everybody knows, every single week we get the joy of meeting new people and hearing their stories, hearing their background, and really taking away little nuggets here and there about how to make better decisions and how to be in a spot in which you're living a uh, really complete, more fulfilling, joy-filled life. And the past episodes have been so incredible. We've had such great feedback from so many people. Thank you so much just for sending back questions, comments, and even just kudos. And so thank you so much for that. Uh, today, I am super excited to bring to you Dr. Paul Dillon. And you, I'm just really excited. We've, the last couple of minutes we've spent just talking here and hearing more of Paul's background and the kind of things he's learned over the years. I know you're going to take away just a lot of information. And, you know, Paul has received, a goodness, a number of different degrees. He has degree from John Carroll University, his master's degree from Northern Illinois University, doctorate of humanities with honors from the Chicago School of Military Experience, also experience in the corporate world with MSF Gladry, areas as far as owning his own individual uh, businesses. Most recent years, adjunct instructor down at Duke University as a visiting professor of the practice at Sanford School of Public Policy for the last almost six years now. Uh, phenomenal background, and guys, you're going to be so pleased and so encouraged by what you're here today. And uh, Paul, I'm so excited to have you here with us, and thank you for joining the show. John, thank you so much for inviting me, and it's my honor and privilege. You know, Paul, I want to, first of all, I'll tell you, thank you for your service in the military. I know you were in the Vietnam War and uh, spent time there, and thankfully, as we talked earlier, you made it home. And so we have so many listeners of our show that are either retired or active military, and uh, so many other phenomenal people that love our country, and uh, they're so much so much supportive as far as the values we have here. And uh, so we're definitely so great, thankful for the country we live in, the freedoms we have, and also the opportunities we have. And uh, after your time in the military, you uh, came home, and the world's a different place in the early 1970s from what it is today. And uh, the view of wars and uh, the warrior and everything, and there is horrible things that we went through and coming back home, lack of support. And things have changed a little bit. And uh, in that time, you went on a journey then as far as in your career, as far as educationally, as far as in work life. And whenever I was thinking about that, I, I, one time period really stood out to me is that you spent some time working over at McGladry. And can you kind of walk through your role at McGladry and, and kind of what years you were there? Sure. I actually, we started out as a small consulting firm. Mm. Checker, Simon, and Rosner, and then um, American Express Tax and Business Services bought us, and we were a division of American Express then. And then in late 20, H&R Block and their accounting arm called RSM McGladry, now it's just called RSM, mm -hmm. bought us. And that was an opportune time for me to, to try something different. So in early 2006, that I was at at all these firms, these these firms, the three that I mentioned, for a total of about fifteen or sixteen years. So, and in later years, you know, my role was to bring in business, which I was pretty good at, I mm -hmm. think. So, it and when we were bought by RSM Magladry, it was time to look at something else, and. I really didn't have the idea, John, of starting my own firm. I wanted to do something creative. The happiest times, the best times I had in my 43 years of consulting was when I could create a new service for the firm, or which I did on occasion, and then create some innovative solutions for clients. I really liked that that part of that part of the professional services industry. So it was time to try that. And so I did, I, I tried it, but it didn't turn out the way I thought it was going to turn out. I mean, I thought I was going to develop project management and business development services for various companies in the service industry. That really didn't, uh, that was hard to do and didn't turn out. So I had to pivot 
several times. And one of my clients was Crane Chicago Business, which is the prominent business publication in Chicago, both online and in print. And there's one in New York, there's one in Detroit, there's one in Cleveland, part of Crane's Communications. Mm -hmm. And I did some research for them and articles they might want to write and helped them out with some events. And they came to me in 2011 and said, you know, Paul, we'd like to do something in the publication around Veterans Day of 2011. We don't know what it is. We don't know if it's an article, whether it's a focus group, whether it's an advertising. We don't know. But we need some research done on it, and we feel you're the guy to do it because you're a vet. So I said, well, okay. <laughs> this was an opportunity to really learn something about this because nobody had really done anything back in 2011 on companies and programs for hiring veterans. Mm -hmm. So I spent about five months full time much more than was necessary, John, <laughs> or that, that I got paid for. Yeah. How many pages are in that? Are in that I research? don't know, <laughs> but there's a lot of research here. <laughs> Just so you know, yeah. did a lot of research, which turned into a very successful focus section for them on veterans in the workplace. Hmm. Very successful. And Crane's got new advertisers for it. It got new, it's got some national exposure. Now I knew something about companies and programs that hire veterans. Hmm. And that led then to some other opportunities, just like I was telling you. Mm -hmm. One thing lead, can lead to another if you keep your eyes open and your ears open. Mm -hmm. And that led some to some other opportunities. And that started me on the veteran journey. This is something I didn't think I would be doing, but it's been a great journey and I really have enjoyed doing it. You know, Paul, you had just said to keep your eyes open for opportunities. And I know you and I had talked even before we started recording just about all the opportunities out there that people are faced with. And sometimes they don't consider those opportunities or they don't, they're not as part of their maybe their goal or their dream or whatever. Do you think that there's ever an age where you need to stop looking for opportunities or should you always have a mindset of always looking and seeing what's available? There is never an opportunity. There is never an age mm. to stop looking for opportunities. Mm. I have my computer screen on now and I'm looking at one <laughs> while I'm talking to you <laughs> that I'm going to follow up on after we're done. So there's never, uh, you know, you, it's very important to keep your eyes open and mm -hmm. look into an individual's eyes when they're speaking, yeah. because the eyes are the windows of the soul, Michelangelo mm -hmm. says, but just as important, keep your ears open, not only for what people say, but how they say it. Uh -huh. Because sometimes they're hesitant and you can detect that in their voice and it opens up an opportunity for you. Mm -hmm. So these opportunities may not fit in with your goals, but they can be great opportunities if you decide you want to follow them. And as I've said to other people, if the horse comes along and it looks good, get on and ride it. What do you got to lose? It doesn't work out. Well, a lot of things don't work out, but some things do. So have your eyes and ears open. Look for opportunities that come along all the time. And I, as I, we were discussing before, instead of have, people have goals, well, that's okay. But the problem with goals is they get wedded to them and they don't see opportunities might come along that don't fit in with their goals. Mm-hmm have a strategic vision, some general direction you want to go uh, so that you're not aimless, but that you're open to other opportunities when they come along. And I think that's very important. You know, that is 
And I'll tell you what, folks, if you uh, were able to listen for the first seven minutes, that is an unbelievable nugget right there to always keep in mind. It doesn't matter, you know, if you're if you're just starting out in your career, if you're a student, it doesn't matter if you're mid-career, it doesn't matter if you are end of career, if you're retired, if you're late stage retirement. Goals, setting goals versus strategic vision is a critical concept to wrap your mind around is to give you that general idea of what you're what you're here to accomplish, what direction to go generally, but keep your eyes open for opportunities because if you don't, you may miss that opportunity that really gives you where you where you ultimately find the greatest contentment and joy and peace. And so, you know, Paul, that that's that's worth the price of shit today, quite honestly. <laughs> the whole thing of vision. You know, I was thinking yeah. back in your career, you've had some tremendous opportunities in walking through a lot of different things. I want to go back actually to the very early part of your career. So you were an edu- you went into school, you're there at Northern, and, and so you're heading down a certain path. And then all of a sudden the draft happened and that took you down a different path. And so you spent some time as far as in the military. And in that time, you know, you had your experiences with the U.S. Army Reserve as a first lieutenant, you're a Vietnam War veteran. How did that time influence your decision to help veterans start their own businesses? Uh, well, first of all, I wasn't drafted. Oh, you were not? Okay. No, no, I was ROTC. Okay. So I got commissioned when I graduated from college in 1967, got my bachelor's degree. Then I got a delay of active duty to go to Northern Illinois University. Mm-hmm. And then after that, then went in the Army. So I wasn't drafted. Mm-hmm. I was ROTC. So okay. I went in as a, as a second lieutenant. And then the obligation back then for reserve officers was two years of active duty and six years of reserve. So, so that I spent two years in active duty. But how that experience back then, when I got out in early 71, 1971, shaped me is, John, when we came back, there was nothing. There was no direction. There was no help. We were shunned. We were hated. It was an entirely different time. And it was very difficult for us when we came back, even though I was an officer with a master's degree, to get a job. Mm-hmm. So fortunately, since that time, the nation has learned from what we went through. And they've been able to separate. I think the nation has been able to separate the warrior from the war. Mm-hmm. So no matter what your feelings are about any of the wars that these young people have come back and participated in, they don't combine, you know, they're able to separate the warrior from, from Mm -hmm. that. So I think that because there was nothing, you know, and I experienced that there was nothing that made me wanted to do, want to do something. And let me read just a couple of sentences. And this is from my profile in a book called The Third Act, Creating Your Next Chapter by Joss Sapin. And it's a great book. He has profiled, I think, 56 people, some famous, Alan Alda, you know, and, and others, some not so famous like me. Mm-hmm. And, and he's profiled uh, these people, including me, in what we, how we came about our third acts. Let me read the sentence. After a 40-year career as a consultant, Dylan found a way to redress that, what I talked to you about, that we were given nothing. He believed that the country had changed, having learned to separate the war from the warrior, but he still saw a need to help veterans who wanted to start a business. Mm -hmm. And that really, in those sentences, summarized how I felt. Mm -hmm. That's very insightful. And folks, that third act, Reinventing Your Next Chapter, it's a hardcover book with Josh Sapin. Uh, you may be able to get it as far as download, as far as in digital. I'm not sure. You yeah, you can. Be able to, yeah, yeah, you can. It's a great book. And you can, you know, particularly learn from all the profiles about how people looked at, some people call it retirement. Mm-hmm. I call it post-achievement. I didn't invent that term. I heard it and I loved it. You learn how people viewed their post-achievement life and everybody from famous people to Rita Marino, you know, all these famous people and then not famous people like me. Uh-huh. So it's very, it's a great book. Josh did a wonderful job and I'm so proud he 
he selected my profile. So yeah, you know, Paul, that's a phenomenal to be included in that book. It really speaks to more even to be in the book. It really speaks to just your your viewpoint as far as on enjoying life and continually challenging yourself and finding new opportunities. And it speaks so well of that mindset. You know, when I was thinking about that time in the military, I, I keep on going to this 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 phrase here, bunker labs. Can you walk everyone through what Bunker Labs is and what inspired you to create that? Well, first of all, I didn't, I'm not the founder of Bunker Labs. Okay. That is a young former naval officer by the name of Todd Connor in Chicago. He's just a wonderful young man and, and his colleagues, and he's the founder of it. But I can tell you how the concept got started in 20. 13, I sat down with the publisher of Crane Chicago Business, who was a good friend, and I said to him, David, I said, you know, Chicago wants to be the startup capital of the world. The mayor is Mayor well, back then, who's now the U.S. ambassador to Japan. He wanted the, the Chicago to be the startup capital of the world. And he, along with the Pritzker family the, of Hyatt Hotel fame, started an incubator in Chicago called 1871, which was named after the year that the Chicago reinvented itself from the Chicago, Great Chicago Fire. And Chicago is really pouring a lot of resources into helping entrepreneurs, would-be entrepreneurs, start businesses. And I said to him, David, why don't they do any, anything for veterans? I said, there's I don't know, 700,000 veterans in the metropolitan area or something like that. I said, why, why aren't they doing anything for veterans? And I said, maybe somebody should write an editorial or an op-ed about that. So my good friend puts down his fork and looks at me and he says, why don't you write one? <laughs> so I did. It was called... And I can send this to anybody. It's all in my LinkedIn profile. You know, Chicago's a startup city, but not for vets. Let's just say, John, that that got a spirited reaction from a number of different parties. I can just, I cannot imagine. Incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so that got me an interview with the young man who was with the Chicago Entrepreneurial Council at that point in time who was running 1871, whose father was one of my earliest mentors. So I knew the young man, knew his father very well. Both are great, great gentlemen. And I said to him, Jim, you know, I mean, and he had read the op-ed and he said, you know, we're not ready to do something yet. This is only our first year, but maybe the second year we'll have some discreet sections of our incubator for women and veterans and maybe medical people who want to start businesses. So I wrote for them a one-page uh, framework outline of how an incubator for veterans might be organized and how it might run. Gave that to him. I moved down to North Carolina in 2014, and along comes the bunker. So Todd, you know, and his colleagues and others had uh, picked up on the idea, and they did a magnificent job. I mean, they just, it was very successful. Now it's called Bunker Labs. It's a part of Syracuse University, their Veterans Affairs Department. And I think that there's chapters in, I don't know, 53 cities around the around the nation. There's one down here called Bunker RDU, RDU after the call letters of the Raleigh-Durham Airport. So the bunker has been very successful. So I'm proud of the concept. And that's what I did. And But it's Todd and his mm -hmm. colleagues and all the people who have come after him who have really, really promoted this and done it. So um, there was a start you know, and very happy to see it. It's interesting too. That was an opportunity that was presented to you just in conversation. And it's amazing to see what happened from that. I mean, bunkerlabs.org, folks, if you want to look that up, it'll be in the show notes also, as well other links to Paul's writings and some of his other works and speaking engagements. So I encourage you to check those out for Paul there as far as in the 
the show notes, but for sure, bunkerlabs.org. Um, you can kind of look to see what can happen whenever you have an opportunity before you and you hop on that horse and begin writing. And then you hand off to somebody else in some way or somebody takes your opportunity and runs with it. It's amazing the impact. And so, you know, when I look at that and I kind of look at your your history, Paul, and I know you've mentioned, you know, and over the course of your career having to pivot several times before, you know, like this success with Bunker Labs happened and that came out of that opportunity. Can you share just some of the different challenges that you faced? I know you had one as far as even coming back uh, when you first came back from the war and the challenges involved in finding work. And can you think of any other ones that you can share in different ways or mentality that you would use to overcome them? John, I, you know, I, I've given you some pivots that that when I went out on my own, I had to do, you know, and each iteration of the jobs that I've had have been kind of a pivot. But let me get to the key lessons that I've learned from that, mm-hmm. because I think they were important. They were important for me. Whether they're important for others, I, I don't know. The first is, is that your first idea for a business might not work out. Be flexible. Find an area or an industry that's underserved mm-hmm. and where you can add some value. Then go for it. Don't take no for an answer. There's always more than one way to skin a cat. So be flexible. Find an area that's underserved that you can do something about and go for it. The second lesson is just what we mentioned. Keep your eyes and ears open. Because opportunities come along all the time. And I think that's the second lesson that I've learned from the journey that I've had. I'll tell you, those are two two huge key um, things that applies to a lot of different people. And uh, we have a lot of clients, personal clients, and we have a lot of uh, folks that follow us and listen um, to our show that they are they're military, they're current or former, but they also are entrepreneurial. And uh, so they're an aspiring entrepreneur trying to think about going into things. And so when you think of that mix of veterans that are also entrepreneurs, which we have a lot in that category, is there anything you can think of when they're considering starting their business? I know you kind of gave us a couple key pivots here, points right here as far as your pivots. Is there anything additional you can think of that specifically would apply to those individuals as they're looking on heading out into being an entrepreneur? I think veterans make great entrepreneurs as well as great employees. And I think for several reasons, and this is, they need to emphasize these reasons, both when starting their own businesses and particularly when they're going for employment. The first thing that the military service will teach you is the focus on accomplishing the mission. Military service is very mission driven. So you want to, you have a great intense intensity to successfully accomplish that mission. And not everybody has that training in them. And I think that's very important. You know, it's been mentioned several times in various aspects that the reason why veterans' businesses countries are successful is because military veterans have learned to accomplish the mission. The second is a very much of a commitment to hard work. The Army used to have a say, saying, we do more by 9 a.m. than most people do all day. Yep, yep. Let me tell you something. <laughs> For those of us who are not early risers, That is entirely true. You have done by 9 a.m. more than most people could ever imagine. So there's a great commitment to hard work. And I think that's a trait that makes you a successful entrepreneur, successful in business. Mm -hmm. The third is the ability to function as a member of the team and lead a team. All of military service is buddy driven. So you don't do anything alone. You operate as a team. And if you have a leadership position, you learn to lead a team. Mm. And that's something that most businesses certainly need. And a lot of people never have experience in. The fourth thing, and people don't think about this, 
is the ability to pivot on a moment's notice from plans that aren't working to plans that do. People think the military is all about following orders. Yes, that's true. But I got to tell you something, Lieutenant Creekmore. <laughs> if your battle plan isn't working, you better figure out something that does. Because you're going to kill a lot of people. Yeah. This isn't a matter of corporate profits. This is a matter of life and death. Mm. So the ability to pivot immediately from plans that aren't working, Lieutenant Creedmore, mm -hmm. to plans that do, is very, very important. Mm. You figure it out, you figure it out now, and you, you run with it. Mm. There's one final point that is extremely, extremely important. Duty before self and taking care of your people. It's been interesting to me that the business world has discovered servant leadership. If you mm. take care of your people and customers or clients, profits come. Mm -hmm. John, the Army has been teaching servant leadership for over 243 years. If you can't, if people don't have confidence that you're taking care of them while you're accomplishing the mission, they ain't going to follow you. Yeah. Nobody is going to sacrifice themselves for your silver star or your legion of merit. They're not going to do it. So mm -hmm. they have to have confidence that you're going to take care of them while you're accomplishing the mission. Mm -hmm. It's the best leadership training in the world, mm. bar none. You know, Paul, I'm just sitting here, right, taking notes. And I know those that are listening and not viewing our YouTube, they don't get to see that. I pretty much have my head buried taking notes for a lot of our conversation, Paul, and so many incredible nuggets. I was looking over your time as an adjunct professor down at Duke, and um, I was just sitting here thinking, what a what an incredible class to be able to sit down and listen to you and go through uh, items like this. I've not even talked about your time in education. Um, as far as your role at Duke and other universities that maybe you've been affiliated with, um, as far as in more of a uh, speaking or lecture time, what type of topics do you cover as far as from professorship? Of course, at, on the veterans, which I haven't taught in a while, but I'm looking forward to uh, doing it again, covers the full range of veterans issues. Mm -hmm. So everything from mental health, and legal issues, housing and homelessness, employment, and entrepreneurship. So mm -hmm. we cover the gamut of, of all those issues. And because I discovered, and this is actually a course that I started as a mini course at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago, mm -hmm. which resulted from the op-ed that I wrote at Cranes. Here we go, one thing leading to another. And what became obvious was nobody could be an expert in all those areas. Mm -hmm. So I bring in experts in each of those areas to, to the class and to talk about uh, each of those areas. And then I moderate the discussion because I know something about these issues. And in the students do a little presentation on on each of these issues and that counts for part of the grade but the majority of their grade comes from what we term service learning mm. the veterans the students in the class who are mostly public policy but some are come from the divinity school because they're starting to be chaplains mm -hmm. both active duty and va and need to go out into the community and do a project that benefits a veteran nonprofit organization. And that is graded. So they're learning by doing, and what they're doing is something that is very beneficial mm -hmm. to the uh, veteran community. Mm -hmm. So it's been a great experience, and I've learned as much from it as the students hopefully <laughs> have. But there was one student who wrote on their evaluation and because I bring out all the, you know, I've had all this, you know, John, 40, 43 years of business, you've made a lot of mistakes, you know. So one young person wrote on their evaluation, Mr. Dillon is a life coach. Mm. I set that aside. I mean, because I'd like to think 
that some of the experiences that I've had, the terrible mistakes that I've made, mm-hmm. I can help people not make those mistakes sure. and advance further. Yeah. Yeah. I would agree with that. And it's all the things we go through in life and the openness and willingness to share about the those mistakes and also any of the successes. But so a lot of times the successes are really due to other people's involvement. And, you know, I was thinking about just, you know, you were talking to you as far as with Todd Connor, as far as a bunker labs and how, you know, he took that and ran with it and had a huge impact. So I think you're right. Being open and discussing those things can impact people's lives in huge ways. You used a phrase earlier, (laughs) (laughs) post-achievement. I heard that and I kind of liked it. I, I'm not the originator of that. I know. So. I, I love yeah. that phrase. Yeah. I, yeah. I yeah. That yeah. You know, a lot of people would look at your career and say, hey, when RSM, uh, you know, bought out your company, that uh, your uh, unit there, that you would, that would be your retirement time. And you'd be retired and done. And, and yet you seem to have a mentality that, you know, it's that next stage of life. It's post achievement. We're always continually growing and learning and, having opportunities. And and when I think about that, I look onto really clients that uh, I've worked with for years and they get to retirement and some have this mentality that I retire, therefore I'm done. And they kind of, they no longer engage and no longer look for opportunities. And it's got a huge negative impact on them, quite honestly. And so when I think about that, there's this phrase called a bridge job. And how would you describe a bridge, a bridge job? And what, what does that look like as far as folks as they're maybe going to that next stage and transition? Well, I created my own bridge job by starting Dillon Consulting Services. And I think anybody who has an expertise in something can be a consultant on their own, sole proprietorship, and that expertise can be sought out. And I know when my father retired from his company, he wrote some you know, policy papers, sales guidance, you know, and this is back in the, I think he retired in 1981, you know, back then. And, and so he did some things. And I think, so if you have an expertise, you can go ahead and try to sell it, you know, and whatever that expertise is, you can be a sole proprietor on your own and go ahead and do that. You can also teach, Mm -hmm. you don't have to teach it. Duke or UIC, you know, University of Illinois, Chicago, or Governor State University, you know, where I taught, you can teach at a junior college. Mm-hmm. You can teach at a organization that uh, gives seminars for senior citizens, you know. You have skills. You may not think you do, but if you spend time in retail, manufacturing, government, professional services, it doesn't matter John, what field you're in, you have skills. I'll get to that later, just a bit later. Mm -hmm. I understand why people leave their full-time job at 62, 65, 70. They want to go out and play golf, play tennis, take trips, see their family. I get that. And a lot of times that's for their own mental health. And I get that. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important to do, but you have skills and the world needs those skills. Mm -hmm. Why do you think you're done? Mm -hmm. Look at how broken the world is. Mm -hmm. Look at how much poverty there is, racism. Mm -hmm. Look at how broken the world is. You can do something about it. Mm -hmm and a volunteer op- in any number of ways, the volunteer opportunity, what, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. You are not done. The world needs those skills that you have. And I think that that's just so important. All of the great religions of the world have the tenet that we need to be dedicated to our fellow human beings. Christian faith says, faith without good works is meaningless. Mm -hmm. The Jewish faith says, tikkamolem, repair the world. Every great religion of the world has a tenet to take care of our fellow men and women. Mm -hmm. You have the opportunity 
And I would dare say, I think the obligation to do it. Mm. You are not done. The world needs you. Mm. When I got my honorary doctorate from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology last October, I ended with what these graduates needed to do to heal the sick, to comfort the sorrowful, and to shed the warm light of hope mm. on all those suffering in the darkness of despair. Mm. Don't we all have that obligation in some way? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We do. Paul, I'll tell you what, that's, I think that's, you and I could talk for hours uh, on this. And um, I think that to me is a phenomenal point to leave. And so the uh, information has just been phenomenal. I thank you so much, Paul, for spending time with us. We'll probably want to reconnect and do chapter two at some point. Mm -hmm. And so looking forward to that. Paul, as far as anything before we go, any last words you want you have to you'd like to give? I think after what I've said, I have no other last words. I, <laughs> you're speechless. If somebody, I, I'm speechless. You know, if somebody, I, I don't know if you're going to have my contact information, but somebody can reach out to me if they're yeah. if they're interested. You know, and I think you know. Yeah. I hope I've done okay. Yeah, I'll tell you what. We we'll have all the contact information in the show notes. Everybody, make sure you pick up on those and feel free to reach out with Paul with contact info uh, that you need for that. I also have links. Um, into a number of the resources and websites and even articles that Paul's mentioned and a couple other special treats in there. So make sure you check those out. And everybody, thank you so much for listening again to Great Decisions, Incredible Lives. And we'll look forward to talking with you all next week right here. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you again for listening to the Great Decisions, Incredible Lives, Retire with Intention podcast with host John Creekmer. Follow us on social media, visit our website, and join our community of like-minded individuals redefining retirement and living incredible lives. Please leave us a review and share our podcast with others who may benefit. We wish you a future filled with purpose, fulfillment, and the joy of living your incredible life in retirement.